Hello everyone, uh, welcome to another video. Uh, this one's kind of been a long time in the making. I've been very, very excited to do it. Um, so I'm, I'm finally happy that it's finally able to get out. It's been a long process, been in the works for a long time, but uh, we, we made it happen, so I'm really excited. So uh, if you know me, you know that I'm a very, very proud alumni of the University of Oregon. Um, it's where I really found myself and where I uh, began my engineering career. And a lot of the things I've learned have been kind of emulated in, in the videos that I made. Um, and so I, I had an opportunity to go and speak to a seminar, um, a course, it's like a course seminar hosted by like actually one of my favorite instructors at the University of Oregon. And so being able to have the opportunity to go and speak to the students, talk about my experience and kind of help them uh, was a, a really, re really special moment for me. So I want to give a special thanks to Eugene Tan for uh, recommending that I do this. He's the one that got me in touch with Eric um, and Professor or Instructor Eric Wills for having me on. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that I was in uh, Eric's class and I loved every moment of it. He's one of the few people on this planet that can make assembly code interesting. Uh, so uh, being able to kind of come back and give back to the community and like help these students going through uh, and starting their their careers was a really, really powerful moment for me. And uh, just want to give you a couple disclaimers before the video starts. Uh, one, uh, the audio and video is pretty bad. It was recorded on a webcam and that's kind of on me. I should have known better. I should have like set up my camera and uh, recorded with my equipment, but I didn't. So that was my bad. So I had to go back and put closed captioning on the video just because like they're just they're just areas in the videos that just completely cut out and have zero audio. And so um, that was kind of a shame, but I do feel that the video was really good and the session was really good and there's a lot of good learnings that can come out of it still. And I just didn't want to just like delete it and like forget about it. Like I'll, I'll do my best to get the best of like make, make it good, but um, it's, it's pretty bad if I'm going to be honest. And the second thing is I apologize for my stuttering for all the ums and likes it's i was i'm honestly pretty i was pretty nervous and it was kind of my first time like giving a presentation like that in a long time so i was very very uh out of my element uh sure i should have in retrospect i should have practiced a little bit more uh, but i didn't so i kind of just won a lot of it and uh, i hope that it's still entertaining uh useful helpful and um, yeah, en enjoy. And then I'm gonna talk about like kind of things I wish I knew. And I tried to approach this from like being in your position because it wasn't that long ago where I was like literally a student and sitting where you are now. So I'm trying to like come up with things that I learned while I was interviewing slash like got into industry that I thought, man, like if I knew this when I was like in class, man, I, I would have accelerated this process so much easier for me. Uh, so hopefully that will be a value to y'all. Um, big big elf in the room, you know, with all the tech layoffs and stuff. I I do have some thoughts about it. Um, as someone that's like kind of been on the inside and not affected by it, but have had teammates and like people that are really close to me that like were really instrumental in my career that were affected by it, and then like we had a lot of conversations like within our teams about it. So um, I'll share my thoughts from the inside point of view. Um, and then I'll have a Q&A, which is kind of like, good. I'm hoping to be the bulk of this, and um, I'll have my contact at the end in case anyone wants to reach out and um, do, like, learn more. I'm always willing to share information and connect with you all. Um, so that's me, that's my badge. Um, yeah, I graduated in 2019. I double majored in math. Any any math computers, computer science location here? One, two, we yeah, have two math kids. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it... Man, it was rough, okay? But um, I, it's very well worth it, so very proud of y'all for doing that. Um, during my time here, that's kind of like all the extra papers that I was a part of. It's kind of the subset of what I've done. And I made it intentional to juxtapose how big that block is versus how small the, like the educational block is. I mean, don't get me wrong. I took my studies very seriously, but I do think like college is a learning institution, yet the bang out from your butt by being involved and like creating connections and meeting people. And that, that has served me way better um, than my 
academic skills, quite frankly, uh, post grad. So if, if you are not involved, like I, I highly recommend you do. Um, so yeah, that's just a quick plug for that. Um, I've been at Amazon for three years, seven months, and six days to the date. Uh, yeah, I checked in the morning just to make sure that that was right. Um, during my time at Amazon, I've done a variety of things. So that's the things I did. The first team that I joined out of college um, was in the transportation organization. Um, the team is called Handful, stands for Global Adverse Management. And effectively, what we did was um, we owned an internal tool for operators and like other personnel in the company that works on gathering uh, address attributes. And what that effectively means is we send people out into the world and then they look at physical buildings and physical spaces and collect a bunch of data to help delivery drivers deliver packages, right? You can imagine like when you deliver a package to a house versus like a commercial building, the experience is completely different. And so the charter that we had, the North Star was, no matter your tenure, no matter if this is your first time delivering a package ever or if it's a million, you would have all the data and like the, the information necessary for you to successfully deliver the package. Um, and it gets increasingly complicated because you know, you're delivering places in the world that don't have a formal infrastructure. So how do you capture address attributes that way? So like it was a very interesting problem, it was very like big, big problem. I had a, a lot of on call nightmares with that team, but it was, it was super fun. After that time, I um, transitioned into doing a little bit more machine learning. I wanted to get into that space and working on AI. And so that's why I did the university team uh, with selling our identity. Um, effectively, what we did there was um, we built models that help vendors and sell and manage their assets. Um, effectively, the goal was any business or any company that, that does work with Amazon, we would effectively know their entire um, business structure. So the, the classic example that we always give is Procter & Gamble. It's like this huge corporate conglomerate that owns like a bunch of brands. And those brands own a bunch of project, pro products. And like we were essentially mapping that out so that we can help vendor managers manage all of the POs, purchasing orders. Um, but also at the same time, when you understand all of these product structures, you can effectively use it as bot detection. So like if we know a certain product is associated with this code with this company, if you see this product getting listed under a different code, you're gonna be like, well, historically that's not the case. So we can flag this as like potentially like selling fraudulent items. Um, and then we can investigate that and help, you know, rectify any any sort of fraudulent activity that happened. Um, so that was a cool time too. I'm currently part of that team. And I'm slowly transitioning into a new team that's getting spun up. Um, it's under the listings org. There, I put TBD there because we're still trying to figure out a name and we're still trying to figure out our charter as well. So it's like very new, like probably going to transition within the next like week or two. Um, so that's a little bit about what I've done. Um, and here's some things about it. Um, I'm sure if any of you like looked at it even moderately in depth, you will know about the leadership principle. Um, principles. They're they're not just something to hang up on the wall. Like we know we actually use them to like guide decision making. Um, and I feel like this is going to be the case for a lot of like big tech companies. There's always like guiding values or something, and they're usually like kind of a like a gimmick for behavioral interview questions. But I think it's really important to actually like take a look at those and really think about how they align with kind of your values because. A lot of decision making is guided by those principles. So um, it's not something that you can just, it's not, it's not corporate lingo, it's real stuff that they use. Um, my experience at Amazon personally, uh, I've noticed that there's a lot of autonomy. There's a bunch of strategy work that you get to do if you want, um, design work that you get to do if you want, uh, and you can even start your own projects. But if you want to steer away from doing that more creative thinking, you can still like, just work on projects that are assigned to you by your manager um, or like a project manager. But uh, having that option is super awesome because, you know, sometimes it can get stale and sometimes it gets boring and you kind of want to do something that's, that you have feel, that you feel you have a little bit more ownership in. So there's always an option for that and I love that. Um, 
And there's also a bunch of opportunities to develop the skills that you want. And I, I think this is probably like one of my favorite things about that you can enroll in courses that are just like free to you. Like just like look up a course that you want. Like I, I remember I wanted to learn about blockchain. So like there's like a blockchain course that like, I took and I just got that like write that off as like this is my personal development and like no one's gonna bat an eye about that. So like if you want to like develop a skill that you know you never had the opportunity to it's a good time to do it if you join a company. And I bet like any other company that you join is gonna have something very soon. So take advantage of that. Um there's also conferences, those are also really fun. I may do it so I get free t-shirts, but there's also good learnings as well. And there's interesting workshops and presentations. You can learn a lot from like other people that are working in the same company. Um, sometimes they bring it on other companies so that you can get a point. Um, teams usually have on-call rotation. This this is one that surprises a lot of people, but if you join a company that's like really big, that usually does work. Chances are there's not going to be an on call. If, you know, if something goes wrong in the middle of the night, someone has to fix it. You can't just like let it go. So, um, I don't go on call very often. It's only like maybe once a day or two weeks. It's something good to know that I didn't know going in. So when I was reading the like job description, I was like, what does it mean to be on call? Um, so that's what that means. And um, yes, if you like working on Amazon, and no, I was not like paid or told to tell you that. Like this actually like my genuine, genuine feelings. Um, and the company is working, and uh, that that's just kind of a segue into my next part. Um, so these are my favorite quirky things about Amazon. Uh, one is the unnecessary set one list. You can effectively think set one as like deck on one. Like that's kind of our internal way of like measuring like the severity of an event. So a step one is like, we're about to lose millions of dollars within the next couple hours. Like, like you might have senior leadership in the call, you might have VPs in the call, you might have directors, senior managers in the call. It's like a call of like hundreds of people. Um, and it's called unnecessary step one because oftentimes that isn't like this sort of scale doesn't is it communicated to like a new hire, and so someone will accidentally trigger a set one not knowing what it means. So my favorite one, was, um, there was this lady that was doing a recruitment that thing and she wanted, she needed a table. And so she's like, oh, I didn't cut that so I just like, cut set one ticket. And like, so multiple teams <laughs> got engaged, like people from like different geo locations all got on a call. They looked at the ticket, it's like, someone get her this table, so quickly cut this out. And so that no senior managers come in here because they're gonna get mad because they got, in the middle of the night. Um, another one was uh, some engineer thought it would be funny to write a script that would go through the um, internal uh, company directory and put a mustache on everyone. And he simply did so, but they didn't they they didn't know how hard it was to take it off. And so the process of taking it off of everyone was like really painful and very very resource intensive. Uh, but that's another one. There, there's a whole list of them. It's really funny. And I love the fact that someone took the time and like actively looking for these and like curating a list for everyone to like enjoy. Like, just think that's funny. Um, the second one is Amazon achievements. It's kind of like the idea is like if like if, if you like play video games, like if you're on Steam, like there's like the like the game achievements. It's like that, like as an engineer at Amazon. So here are a couple of my favorites that I've done. Um, in the bottom right there. Uh, the receive a question mark email, that's a, they call it a Jeff Bezos ex escalation. It's like, he doesn't have time to write stuff, so he just sends a question mark to you. And that just means like, fix this. Um, <laughs> just super scary. Yeah, it's, you have to like, you prioritize everything. Um, the other one was, happened very recently actually, uh, speak now or forever both your peace, get paged at a wedding. Uh, thankfully it was after the ceremony and not in the ceremony, but yeah, I got paged in the middle of a wedding. I had to like, like sit there like while well, everyone else is having a good time and try to fix this issue. Um, and getting paid sucks. It's like there's an app on your phone that like bypasses all the like the 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 security to like be quiet. So it's like loud, god awful sound. It's just like whoa, man. Like if I got paid right now, I'd probably jump. Um, and then like TLDR, like approve a one character change in code review. Like you know, we've all done it. Like, there's we're missing a semicolon. Like, it happens in industry just as much as it happens in like in academics. So, like, that one really never escapes you. Um, 
there's funny tools too, like uh, this one called Old Part. Let me see it pop right here. I don't even have to see. But I think some some random person decided to build a tool to show how old you are in the company. So I think this one's mine, and uh, the left side is globally, and the right side is in Portland. So. 78% of the company right now was hired after me. And then in Portland, it was 82%. And so, and I haven't even been there that long, so I don't know why maybe we just scaled up super fast. But yeah, the, I thought that was pretty cool. And then there's another one where the dog thumbnails. Like, I replaced, it, it replaces all pictures of anyone in the company and just like, replaces the picture of the dog. I just love that. <laughs> I love dogs. And then there's also this list. It's funny Amazon reviews. Like, I'm sure some of you have seen it before, like funny Amazon reviews. But man, some of them are really funny. Like that sugar free Arbo gummy bear one. Like, if if y'all can look at that, that uh, those reviews, it's so funny. Like, if you're ever having a bad day, I say go look at that and I'm, I, I promise you, you'll come out laughing. Um, so now we're going to, like, now, now we're done with the bus. We're going to, switch back to kind of being a little bit more serious. Like that was kind of just like a part of the But um, so here are the things I wish I knew like as a student. Um, one, get really good at reading and writing. Like you would be surprised how much of my day is just spent on reading and writing. Like, and I'm, I don't mean like writing code or reading. Like, I mean, just like actually reading and writing. Like, I'm reading and writing, process docs, requirements docs, design docs, like user guides, transition guides onboarding docs all the time like it's the majority of my dog basically and majority of engineers do this too. so it's not like just me. so i think get, getting really good at reading and writing will serve you really really at least it'll help you ramp up very fast and cut down that learning curve um this is where i was talking about the the transition like the, the this technical skills and the soft skills um technical skills i get aka hard skills get you hired the soft skills get you promoted so all of you right now should be should be focusing on tra uh, uh, technical skills, but the moment you get hired, it's 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 time to switch. It's to get ready for the soft skills because that's what's going to take you to the next level. Because you know anyone can code, really, like, but having the insight to know when to, um, to, you know to have like difficult conversations or to manage risks or to um, take initiative on certain things and to have those leadership qualities, those intangibles, like. That's what gets you noticed, and that's what's going to be in your promotion document. It's not about like if you can write, uh, and uh, if you can write more search memory. Like no one's going to read. So, yeah, that that one. If I knew that, I think I probably would have gotten promoted a lot sooner. But yeah, so that's just a warning for now. Um, ask for feedback early and often. So an example of this would be like if I were to be in a interview and there's usually like another person in the interview with you. Um, I always ask them like how they did or um, if I'm doing a design doc or design doc review, I always ask like my manager or whoever that was in the call that I think had a good insight. Like, yeah, give me feedback because there's always room for improvement. Um, that one's kind of hard to do, but I think finding someone that you trust or someone on your team that like has the skills that you'd like to also develop asking them for their feedback is, is great. Um, and it's it's kind of hard to hear it sometimes because you'll have like some brutal feedback. And I think that's like the best, best feedback you can get. That's the that's the good stuff. Um, find a mentor early. Like when you join a company, find someone to mentor you. Find someone that can kind of teach you the ins and outs and like like show you all the ropes and teach you all this private knowledge and, and like implicit knowledge that no one talks about because that will also cut down the learning curve very quickly. Um, invest time in setting up your dev environment. I mentored a couple of people, and um, sometimes when they join, there's like, I want to get on the next project. I want to do the, the project. I'm like, you haven't even set up IE yet. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, no, spend time making your life easier. Like, the, the more you spend on researching good tools, the more time you have time to, like, improve your your development flow it's gonna pay so many dividends down the road. and i'll like watch a screenshot of someone still like not knowing how to use shortcuts to like create a new tab like so you're gonna move this cursor every time to create a new tab like no like we're not doing that like learn these these optimized flows and like get used to them 
Um, fail fast. Have you guys ever like done a project and then basically coded the entire project and then started to test at the end? Like, no, like you should test as much as you can, as fast as you can, and fail those tests as early as you can because then you don't have this long, really, really long, aggravating debug session. And that's the worst. That's the absolute worst. I hate that so much. Um, especially when you're working in like a production environment for a company, it's like, then you're gonna have a super long code review and then like, that's also gonna push your deadline back. So fail fast. Um, uh, don't waste anyone else's time until you've wasted yours. And I think th this is kind of, I, I debated on putting this on because um, it sounds kind of hard, but that you need to have a balance between like being a self-sufficient engineer versus like getting help. I think, yes, ask for help, and that's always there. But at some point, you do need to be somewhat self-sufficient to be able to solve problems. And, you know, I've mentored some people, like, everything they do, they ask questions. And I'm like, that's, that's great. But, like, you need to do the due diligence, doing the research on your own first. And then you ask questions about your stuff. So maybe time box how, how much you're going to do research and then ask questions. Um, the next thing is uh, get your finances in order as soon as possible. There's a good chance that there's a lot of you that are going to join like a very big company or if not many of you, if you keep staying in, in this industry, you're going to be making a good amount of money, a lot of money. Like when I was in college, I was broke. You know, like became in the top 10% of earners, like seemingly overnight. And so you need to know how to manage your funds so that you can maximize how much you keep. Because man, like taxes hurt. They, they they really do. So you know, understand taxes really well and manage your finances and not make bad financial decisions. Like don't go out and buy a car, a house, right away. Build up an emergency fund. So that's really important. And then the last thing is learn cloud based technology, but like, that's where I see it going. Legacy systems are pretty much like quickly dying. And so if you know Azure or even US or any of the that's that's gonna be a real real answer. Because I can't think of any company that's like not doing it. Right. Um, and so I've been actually talking to Phil about mm -hmm. the whole membership or member institution thing. Uh, I reached out to the team. I think Phil's in contact with like an AWS rep that will get that set up. Um, but I'll I'll keep you up Um so in the same vein of things I wish I knew, does anyone know what this is? Does anyone know what an R1 institution is? That's right. So an R1 institution is a doc or a doctoral university that have high research activity. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because I learned this my senior year, and I wish I learned it freshman year, because the University of Oregon is an R1 institution. I mean, like a lot of the faculty here are like top notch researchers. The reason why I tell you that is because this is a study that has been done um, in 2020 of the top companies that invest the most money in research and development. And you'll notice that they're all tech companies. If you look at the top 100, it's like all tech companies with some minor exceptions like uh, the automotive industry. Like, big changes, surprisingly. Um, and the reason why I'm telling you this is because uh, it's really easy for all of you to get get involved with research. Right? And I think it's such a valuable skill set to have. And it was probably one of the most, like one of my favorite experiences when I was here was um, doing research next door actually in the uh, Neuroscience Institute, Institute with a rear lab. And it was super easy. Like I reached out to the professor, I'm like, hey, uh, I see that you need like a computer scientist to like help me manage your data. Like, why don't I'll be a research assistant? He's like, yeah, come in for an interview. It wasn't really an interview, it was just like I was getting coffee. <laughs> and then I started doing research for them. And I, I thought that was such a valuable skill set to have because chances are if you're going into the PF and becoming an engineer, you're gonna do like research because it's such an innovative industry that like why not get that experience now here? And use that to leverage when you get into your interview. 
And the great thing about this institution is like literally anything that you wanted to do research for, like you could do research. Like if you were wanted to do research for neuroscience, you have a department of neuroscience, you want to do research for uh, anthropology, I'm sure they have like a research assistant position open for someone to help with like their techniques. And so take some time like looking into that because not a lot of people know about it. And also there's a, it, it's, a, it's like, it's a win-win situation, right? Like you get experience that helps you leverage in your interviews and they get the expertise they need for their research. Why not do that? Yeah, so I wish I did that like since freshman year, but I hope y'all can recruit, like y'all can take care of that. Um, so as far as the tech layoffs go, um, that first that first line is in quotes, uh, make sure your house is in order. And by the way, it's a metaphor. Your house is um, all the interview material that you'll need in order to like, win. So make sure like your resume is good, make sure that your LinkedIn profile is super up to date, your cover letter is good. But by, when I say good, I mean like one, you thought it out really well, well and it's well curated, but two, also send them to to review and give you feedback so that you can really polish them up. Because I, none of us, none of us are perfect, right? Like we're gonna have blind spots. Having another person that's gonna look at it and maybe you'll give some feedback to them just make it hit that extra harder. Um, and the reason why I'm telling you that is because with the tech line up, you have tens of thousands of tech personnel, well seasoned, experienced tech personnel in circulation. And so those are people you're competing against for these roles. And if you want to be a viable candidate, that needs to be your house needs to be in order, right? And don't get me wrong, it's not like you know you have no chance. Like having fresh young talent is always good. So it's not like they're always going to be favored over you, but having your your assets well managed and good and like well like you have you have good feedback and you have good revisions on it is is only going to make you that much more of an attractive candidate as opposed to someone in institution. So just to give that little push, if you need. Um, look for a good, there's also good opportunities now that like all these tech roles are within circulation because I, I think I think the government is like looking to like snag up like the, the, this talent um, and then you might be able to like sneak in there and also get swept up as well. So it's good, it's a good time to look at other tech because I've noticed that when I was interviewing and Putting out my application, I was pretty much only looking at tech, but there's so many tech roles outside of the industry of tech. Like, like tech is in demand in every sector, and so like maybe look at other sectors. If there's specific companies or specific like um, industries that you're interested in or that you like are passionate about, maybe look into those sectors and see if like there's opportunities there because they often get overlooked and overshadowed by like these big tech companies that have screen. Right? Um, and then like the last bit is um, I why I think these layoffs are happening are, are kind of two things, macroeconomics, like at least that's what that's what is told to us from like upper leadership, um, that like we're in a recession. Uh, so like shaving off some of some of the expenditures. But also I think it is more mainly like an overcorrection from like the scale of from pandemic. Everyone was at home, everyone was using these services. So like these services can be scale really fast, but like the traffic isn't the same now because everyone is out and about again. And so there's I think there's an overcorrection from like the massive scale up that happened. Um I'm no economist, so don't take my like I, you know, I, that's just my guess, right? Um, but I think that's what it is. So with that, I think you can open it to QA. Are we good on time? Oh yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yes. You said leadership is really important. What about structural leadership? Like structural leadership? Yeah. Okay. So if you think about it like a tree, you have chief officers, well, you have the CEO, then you have chief officers, then you have SVPs, and then you have directors. And then where it gets interesting is under the directors, because then you have managers, principal engineers. And then product managers, technical product managers that are kind of like in beard blocks. Um, so that's kind of how the leadership is structured generally. Um, and, and I think that's going to be kind of the same for other companies 
not just Amazon, but that's usually how it works. You have like this group of managers, technical project managers, product managers, maybe even sometimes like other types of engineers, like quality assert, uh, quality insurance engineers and stuff, and then software engineers and whatnot, and maybe product teams. Uh, but that's kind of what it is. But when I when I talk about like leadership and leadership skills, it's mainly like um like how do you get feedback? How do you react to criticism? How do you um kind of come up with kind of come up with like process improvements? Like th those kind of things are kind of outside of the bounds of what an engineer usually does. It, it effectively is a catch-all for like do stuff that engineers usually don't do that's beneficial. Like is really what it is. So uh, you mentioned that you had a background in speaker, but you did some work in speaker. Yeah. So uh, as someone like me, I assume most of us know the background uh, in like traditional computer science, where we learn mostly about algorithms and data structure, a little bit of machine learning, but maybe not a whole lot. What do you think is the best way to develop machine learning skills that would be useful in an environment like this? Yeah. Do your own projects. Uh, so, how do I do this? Um, when I was taking up roles here, like as a student, I was working at an semester. I remember I was asked for my colleagues to help students into like uh, groups. Like that's a that's a way that you can use your CS expertise to like develop a, a real tool for people to use, and you can use that as like a real experience in your interview. Like, I've been asked about that. That was just like what I did as a student. Um, we can go back to the whole um, research thing. Like, yeah, like I was building models, like convolutional neural networks for the neuroscience of it, helping them like gather data, scrub data, and, like, spitting up all these models. Kind of like, so that's also like, something. You do. So it doesn't have to be like, Formal industry experience, like you can just do one-off projects on your own that you're passionate about, and like that, that if anything, it's, it's not coursework. Coursework is what you're supposed to do. No one cares about coursework. Like you just need it so that you get a good grade, so that you can show that you have this competency. But once you do your own projects outside of like academic bubble, things get really interesting. That's what the board is doing. I remember explicitly my my hiring manager telling me anything you're about to tell me right now, we don't want it to be related to the class. <laughs> we don't tell me anything about your course. Don't tell me anything about like your homework. I don't care. I care about what you've done outside. Because that speaks to who like your passion, your character, and like where you choose to focus your time. That's more important to me than how like that you have to I uh, was wondering if you would be fine sharing uh, how many personal projects you have in this Big ones that I was like, that I thought were that I was really proud of, probably like three. Um, and then like a couple like, minor tools I built for myself, like on certain aspects of my life. Like, for example, I used to, um, when I was looking at the public office, when we were interviewing all our days, that whole we would be surprised how painstaking that process. Like you have to create a document for every candidate and manually type in data from a PDF to an Excel sheet. And like, dude, like this is ancient. Like, why are you doing this? So I instead spent time and wrote a Python script and just automatically. Like that, that, that is a real purpose. Like that's just you know, like it's not doing anything, but serving a real purpose. If we actually use it in the housing office during interviews, it's like it's a real project that you can talk about. I think like sometimes like students might have like this this unrealistic view of like what about this piece of project. It's like it's if you do something that's useful to either you or someone else, that's good enough. It doesn't need to be like a whole built out pipeline with the UI backed by a load balancer. Like it doesn't need to be that granular. That's for the company. For you, like it just if it just serves the purpose, that's a, a 
a reasonable purpose, like fuck it. So I guess important to diversify your personal projects, but I don't know. Uh, yes and no, right? I think it depends on like, your your strategy for it. If you want to go for a full stack position, that can be great. But if you want to keep the option open, then you want to like, also have a, a door open for a data science and your project. Um, I'm going to go back to like a quote from like Warren Buffett. He says that I mean, diversification is people that are Know what you want and know what you do that, and like get a double on that. Um, but you're a little bit more risk tolerant than you can be on. So it, it, it's you just gotta have an honest dialogue how much, how, how threat wise, what kind of other Yes. You mentioned that you switched from the transportation team to. Yeah. Yeah, how would you say how do you do this kind of it's, it's pretty easy. Like a uh, short answer is easy. Uh, long answer would be if you set yourself up in a position for an easy reason. If you work in a vacuum and like pretty much no one really knows your name, then it might be harder to convince another team to take you on. But I was Doing everything I can to network and see if I can kind of expand my bubble and my, my sphere of influence a little bit. So that, like, other teams and other managers knew about me. So um, it made that a little bit easier. So, yeah, if you're, if you're more willing to work with other teams, you are. That's a good question. You're going to get that will be my case. But of course, like you still have to like, look at your artifacts. Who are you? If you look at the documents you wrote, and you look at all the projects you've been part of, maybe some testimony and feedback from people that work with you. But yeah, it's a solid person to bring on. So it's not like, hey, they knew me, I'm in. It's, they still have to like, get you. Do you think the tech companies might be over correcting the right now? You just mentioned that you're moving to the next event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I unfortunately that's always happened. Like teams, I and I imagine this is gonna be the same case for like all the big companies and maybe even like startups. Like, and people move around so fast. Like, with, and, and the market moves around so fast. That, like, you're always getting new work. And teams are always moving around, shifting priorities. And, you know, fortunately, like down free, we're gonna have to shift our priorities too. Like, sometimes you're gonna have to drop off. Because like, there's an over collection here, and now we have to work on something that's seemingly more important. I, I, I'm sure, like, you all know about like, Chat GPT, right? Like, that's like revolutionary technology. Now, everyone is like, crap, we need to like maybe think about what we're prioritizing, see if we can build something that's similar that, um, you know, that, that can help us and serve our business. Yeah, it, it's always happening. You're always a like, team change. Maybe not like every week, but like certainly happening. I'm just curious, what's like a percentage of your team or the workforce is like a lot of the remote remotely decided or just the all of the pandemic? Yeah, yeah. Um right now, just like last week on Monday, we got our director and like, hey, come back in office and be three days a week. And like you can come up with this. Like you and your team can come up with this. Right now, I'm still fully remote because um, most of my team is in Seattle, I'm in Portland. So it's, ma it's mainly for Seattle. It's mainly for like the big offices to come back, but like for auxiliary offices or um, positions that have like been hired during the pandemic that were like more remote. You know, there's, there's definitely folks that are like, I'm Three hours job. But you, you can always work it out, but it's a slow transition back. It's more hybrid now. Like at best. I don't I don't think it's gonna go back like full blend everyone anymore. I think it should be a more hybrid.
mostly hybrid, and you have like bear on it. And I do think that fully remote one can still be offered, even you know, after that. No, I don't think it's like I, I don't think it's like specific roles. Well, I, to some degree, yes. Like if if you're working with like pure software, that's all you're doing, then yes, that's, that's you can just do remote you can be an office for you know, on there. And so, but for uh, I told most people in the room, uh, we're fully remote work is fairly common. Oh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I I didn't I didn't add this because I was hoping to. Wait, I did not do the internet. Okay. That doesn't, all right, this is not me saying you shouldn't do an internship. Uh, I just chose to supplement that experience by doing something, doing research, like joining student groups, you know, figuring out a way to like, incorporate like, my CL expertise. That's how I do it. But um, in terms of like, but I do have a lot. You can make it like a couple dozen, a couple dozen, projected every time. But you know, if you draw your code, I did my own. Yeah. Now, if I can just do it, I'm sorry. It's too Yeah. It was kind of a mix. Okay. Uh, so I had probably around five interviews, five or six. I think one of them was more like a conversational, like getting get the interview. Uh, but Definitely five technical questions for sure. Uh, one of them was really messed up, and most of them were like pretty easy. But the one that was really messed up is actually asked by my current manager, so I'm now recording to this kind of like a full loop. Um, he asked me to develop, to write a program that would calculate the pull-outs function of like a certain, like it was a really messed up math problem. I was like, hey, dude, not solve it. Yeah, no, but I wanted to why we can fight the pump, not have to solve it. Like, yeah, so they get pretty hard, but my, my advice for like main uh, questions is as someone that has conducted a fair amount of interviews, I have people like I've noticed that a lot of candidates get so so hung up on like data structures and algorithms and sorting algorithms. You don't, even, you don't even know what the question I'm asking you. Like, let's not think about, let's not think about data structures yet. Like, just understand the problem, right? And so, like, I'm mainly looking at, like, how does this person handle ambiguity? How does this person um, ask questions? Like, where are they making assumptions? And where are they able to recognize they're making assumptions? Uh, and how well they can pass the class? That, to me, is, like, more important. So, like, I've definitely had to see botched the interview question, but the fact that they were able to recognize like certain areas of ambiguity and was able to to communicate really well that I think really fun. You can teach someone that but teaching someone how to ask a thought and be able to to understand where they're making a bad assumption. Maybe they don't know why but they are like you know, it's just Anyone? All right, thank you. Uh, hopefully that was bearable for you all. <laughs> Reach out to me if uh, you know you want to look at your resume or whatever, or if you have any questions that come up post this, because I kind of put y'all on the spot asking stuff, but, so maybe let it marinate a bit and add anything like, yeah.